Welcome into the Odds and Audibles podcast. I'm Matt Preem, Jared Mack on the show. Jared, fresh off a trip to Scottsdale, Arizona to cover the Pac-12 championship. And we're going to talk everything he saw in, in Arizona because Oregon went 4-0 in the Pac-12 tournament. They won the tournament. They get the at-large, or they get the automatic bid, excuse me, out of the Pac-12 for the college baseball uh, tournament and Jared, let's just start there. And, and Scottsdale, um, mm-hmm. it was a wild w- week of games. Four games, um, if not for maybe Stanford throwing a wild throw to third to try and throw a guy out, which they really probably didn't have any business getting, and maybe it doesn't even happen. Yeah, um, it was a up and down four games. Uh, it started on Tuesday night against Cal, a 7 p.m. game. Uh, really just a gross baseball game. Both teams, I think, combined were one for 18 or one for 19 with runners in scoring position. Uh, nobody could get a run in, but Oregon got three of them and Cal got two of them. So Oregon moves on. Uh, Oregon also moved on that game because the shortstop committed an error after Oregon really honestly committed a base running blunder with Bryce Betcher going home on a ground ball to short. But he... Froze, come into the air, and Betcher was able to score, tie in the game, and then a sacrifice fly a batter later from Jacob Walsh uh, ultimately won the game. Uh, and yeah, and then you just keep moving down the line. The Stanford game, like you said, Colby Shade hits a triple. Uh, Stanford tries to throw him out and headed to third. Uh, I think had it been a really good, had it been a good throw, I think it, Colby Shade probably was out, but it wasn't. The throw sailed into the net, uh, just a complete errant toss. And Colby Shade scores, ties the game. Uh, that was a crazy game, one of the crazier moments of the season for sure. That was Oregon's extra first innings too. Extra inning game. Yep, first extra inning game all season long. So they had to wait until the Scottsdale tournament for a 7 p.m. game to do so. Thank you. Um, <laughs> certainly made my night uh, a lot easier. But yeah, and then you move forward. They play Washington. Washington, who swept Oregon in a three-game series towards the end of the season. They win a slugfest basically there. Um, the bullpen dominated Washington. Uh, they dominated the whole tournament, only allowed two or three earned runs the entire tournament, which was great. Uh, yeah, and then fast forward to the championship game, another 7 p.m. another 7 p.m. game at Scottsdale Stadium. Um, just a really good old-fashioned college baseball game. Crowd was electric. There were there were enough Oregon fans to make a difference, but um, you know, no surprise that there was a ton of uh, Arizona baseball fans there. I think the final attendance number was 4,051, so it was pretty packed. I wouldn't say it was quite a sellout, but uh, pretty darn packed. I think there were a lot of Oregon fans for the first two games. They were, they were thinking Oregon wasn't going to go farther in yeah. the tournament. Um, but So there were progressively fewer people who were there over the course of the week, but there was still a good amount of, of Oregon fans there on uh, Saturday night. Um, just a great tournament for Oregon. I, uh, you know, I think they, you know, with the automatic bid now, they didn't have to worry about getting into the tournament. Uh, I think Oregon was probably safe with at least two wins, which they got. But you never know. Like USC and Arizona State both were pretty worthy of getting into the tournament, and they both didn't hear their names get called yesterday on Selection Monday. So whether or not Oregon would have got in, we won't know because they won the whole thing and they got an automatic bid. But uh, they needed it. And they needed it really bad after the last two weeks that they had or two or three weeks of the season that they had um, a lot of momentum riding now into the Nashville regional. Yeah. I was just going to go back to that um, because last time we were on this podcast, we talked baseball was about a month ago, end of April. And I think they just won a, a three game homestand against Arizona state. And we're sitting here talking, hey, they've got Oregon State, they've got USC, Washington, Utah. Things are looking really good for this program. And that Sunday loss to ASU was a start of a run where they lost like eight of nine games. Um, Mm -hmm. They didn't look good. They got swept at home by the Washington schools. Um, I think they lost for Utah in like the first time in a long time. Um, What's the difference between that three week stretch where they went one and eight and then, you know, they closed out the regular season with two road wins at Utah. And now, you know, they go into the tournament, the big tournament on a six game win streak and Pac-12 champions. What what has changed with this team? 
Uh, it's just the pitching. I think it's pretty simple as that. Um, uh, like I've said on this podcast before, Oregon's offense has always hit. Uh, they did so even during that eight of nine losing streak there. They put up um, some du- double digit performances, some six, seven run performances, but specifically against Washington, when you allow uh, 43 runs over three games, that is really, really bad. Um, even those for those that don't know baseball, you can tell Aver- averaging over yeah, you know, like 10 to 11 runs a game is really bad. Um, so that that's what happened in this postseason was Oregon was able to get good starting pitching and uh, really good bullpen outings. Um, I think Turner Spuljarek had the worst performance against Stanford. It was interesting in the post game that kind of he kind of alluded to Stanford knowing probably like knowing what pitches he was throwing. Um, which I thought was interesting because he got tagged. He got uh, seven hits against Stanford and one inning of work for six earned runs. So, again, Stanford's a, a, f- a fantastic team. They're the eighth overall seed in the country. But I thought that was interesting. But, you know, Turner goes out there the next night and throws six innings of th- three or four run ball against Arizona. So he was he said that he was making good pitches and they, he was just getting hit. So sometimes it happens in baseball, but I thought that was interesting. But anyways, uh that was the worst outing for an Oregon pitcher the, the entire weekend. It was was Spiljeric against Stanford, and there might have yeah. been an asterisk against that. But the bullpen, like I said earlier, they allowed two or three earned runs throughout the entire postseason tournament. Um, Grayson Grinsel, a true freshman, a left-handed pitcher out of out of uh, Reno, I think he's out of Reno, um, was lights out. Uh, he started game one, pitched pretty well, kept them in the game. Uh, he, Comes back a couple days later against Stanford, uh, excuse me, you know, against Washington. Strikes out six batters in three and two thirds innings. Just an absolute stud for this whole tournament. Uh, he was one. He was named one of the Pac-12 tournament's best pitchers, uh, rightfully so. Uh, Josh Malaris had a good outing. Uh, Matt Dallas allowed one of the three earned runs. Dylan McShane was really good, and then Austin Anderson, who really had struggled to throw strikes all season long. You can go look at his stats. They look really good on paper, but once you see the the walk to strikeout to innings pitch ratio, it's not great. It's not necessarily what you want from a reliever, but again, another guy who was lights out. I think he got the biggest out of the tournament other than Dallas's final out of the game when he struck out Kike Romero with the bases loaded on a 2-2 slider down and in. Um, just exactly what you needed. And those types of performances were nowhere to be found during that eight of nine losing streak. Uh, Washington, the first game against Utah, Oregon State put up a ton of runs. Um, USC put up a good amount of runs. It just wasn't there. And Oregon really shortened their staff this postseason tournament. Really, we're only throwing like six or seven guys max. Um, and and this, again, this is all without Jay Stoffel and uh, Isaac Ayon, who two guys who would really help this this rotation and this pitching staff, but. Uh, both are still hurt, so they did. The guys who pitched did their jobs. Uh, I think significantly better than any other time during the year. I think that goes again right into my next question: Is I we know pitching's hurt. Just where's the health right now? With a most importantly, uh, Stoffel, he's their top guy. Um, and then B, is there anyone else? Are they going in to postseason play now as healthy as they can be, or? Are there a lot of guys kind of dealing with stuff? I mean, I would that, say no, like, every, like that. Not normally no, I mean, like every every team's gonna have guys hurt. Like, is it just the normal? Right. Hey, they're de- dealing with stuff, or are there are there issues here? There are issues here. Uh, in terms of how healthy they actually are, I'm not sure because, um, like, for the last month since Jay Stoffel has been hurt, we've been healing, hearing decent, decently good things, seemingly progressively better. Um, every time we ask head coach Mark Wazikowski, um, you know, he, he really batted on the hatches and said that Isaac Aon was going to pitch at some time during the regular season. Um, I asked him point blank about it. He said that he's going to throw. That hasn't happened. Uh, Jay Stoffel is continuously day to day, seemingly seemingly an upgrade every time, like I said, that we ask him about it. But, you know, it's been about a month, a little bit less than a month since he's thrown. And uh, that's a huge, huge, huge piece of their pitching staff. Um, if he had thrown enough innings this year, I firmly believe that he would have been Pac-12 Pitcher of the Year. Um, instead, he has a weird nerve injury on his throwing hand uh, and his throwing finger. So he hasn't pitched in a long time. Um, I'm not sure what the case is there, but – 
maybe he throws, maybe he doesn't. If I were an Oregon fan and I were listening, I wouldn't go into the the regional thinking that he's going to throw. Neither would I think that Isaac Aon is going to throw. I mean, Isaac Aon did not make the trip to Scottsdale, so I have a hard time seeing him making the trip to Nashville as well, um, unless barring some significant change. Um, Leo Ullman was another guy who didn't make the trip to Nashville, or excuse me, to Scottsdale, another uh, true freshman starting pitcher. Um, not sure what's up with him. Uh, I'm not sure if that's injury related or something else. And then Matt Dallas came back from injury this tournament, so that was a good sign, excuse me, for uh, for Oregon's bullpen. Um, other than that, I think that Oregon's been pretty healthy. Sabine Ceballos looks a lot better than he did like a week or two ago. Uh, Dominic Hellman is still out probably for the season. Um, I know like I, I texted Waz and said that he, he was day-to-day, but I don't think he's going to be playing anytime soon. Um, but other than that, I think Oregon's injury situation looks pretty good. It's just that it's Stoffel, I mean, it could be the ultimate difference maker in a tournament like this where Vanderbilt is good, yes, but they are not um, – as good of Vanderbilt teams as Oregon has played in the past. Um, they got to play, play Xavier again and a, re- a rematch from the very first series of the season. Um, so it just, it just is, it hurts Oregon more than probably any other position group on their team that Stoffel is hurt and Isaac Ayan is still hurt as well. All right. So look, there's some people that are going to be diehard baseball fans and they know, all the best, all the best players on this team. They know the storylines, and then just like softball, just like basketball, um, there's going to be a, a good chunk of Duck fans that are going to jump on and watch these games starting this past weekend in in Scottsdale. Who are the mm-hmm. offensive players or the fielders um, that you need to know? Who are the guys that are on on fire right now at the plate? Who are who are the guys Oregon's going to be leaning on in Nashville? Man, I mean, their whole starting nine, um, they are really, really talented at on the on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, you go top to bottom, Riku Nishida, Colby Shade, Drew Cowley, Sabine Ceballos, Tanner Smith, Drew Smith, uh, Jacob Walsh, Bennett Thompson, the catcher, and Gavin Grant at second base. Um, all nine of those guys are, are need-to-know names. They all can have uh, a performance that carries the team. Uh, that's what makes this lineup so deadly. Um, against Utah, uh, it was Drew Smith and Bennett Thompson, two guys who kind of were – they were there all season long but weren't the big names. Um, I think Bennett Thompson had nine hits in two games against Utah. Uh, Drew Smith had five RBIs in two games against Utah. You go to the Pac-12 tournament, both of them are continuing to rake. Uh, Gavin Grant has a four-hit performance against Arizona in the final game. Drew Cowley has a four-hit performance in the game uh, before that. Uh Sabine Ceballos drives in six runs against Washington. Like, this is very all spread out. Jacob Walsh hits a six-inning home run against Arizona in the championship game. It's an extremely impressive offense. And, I, that you know, that that's the that's the engine of this team. That's, that's the motor. That's what makes them kick. Um, but I guess some storylines to follow. Drew Smith, uh, true freshman. I know Oregon wanted to redshirt him earlier in the season, but – Cutting some some injury situations, just they had a revolving vo- door at DH and they had to throw somebody in there. But Drew Smith ended up being the guy. Um, just broke Oregon's all time hit record. He now has 19 <laughs> straight games with a hit. Um, he's hitting above 400. Uh, just an absolute bona fide stud. Very excited to see his development over the next couple of years at Oregon. Um, I think he could be shoot. I mean, at this point, he's going to be some guy who's going to get a lot of draft buzz during his junior and maybe even his sophomore season. Um, Riku Nishida, just so much. Fun I love this dude. I love yeah. watching this dude play. Yeah, he's uh, he's truly one of a kind. Um, I've never been on the field or seen baseball games where there's a player like him. Um, he just has all of these antics. I mean, he takes a right handed swing for his warm up swing. Um, two, two strike counts, he squats down in the box. Uh, he's kind of a slap hitter, but has five home runs in the season. He doesn't strike out. I think he has seven or he eight. He uses a wood bat. Season. He uses a wood bat. I always forget about that one because I'm so used to seeing it, but nobody else uses a wood bat. Um, for those who don't listen, uh, college of baseball is metal bats, BB core bats. Uh, anybody using a wood bat is at a severe disadvantage, except for Riku Nishida because he is he's hit four of his five home runs this year with a wood bat. Only, only one with an alu- aluminum bat. Um, and then the, I guess... Do, do we know the, the reason why he uses a wood bat? 
Uh, he said it's feel. He says he just likes it more. Strange. It's awesome, yes. though. Oh, yeah. No, it's tremendous. Um, Riku is a, a junior college transfer from Mount Hood Community College, um, originally from Japan. Um, he's just one of a kind, he truly is. And he's, he gets enough draft buzz that I hope he gets, uh, I hope he gets selected in the, in the later rounds of the draft. Cause he'd be an extremely fun player to, to watch through the minor leagues. But I think the biggest storyline heading into this regional, um, is the big three of Gavin Grant, Drew Cali, and Tanner Smith. Those guys are all seniors. This is all their last run. Tanner Smith has eight or nine, um, career records at Oregon, like hits, extra base hits, RBIs, consecutive games started, things like that. Um, he's been the penultimate player for the University of Oregon. He's grown this program. He's turned it into, or he's helped bring it along and turn it into this postseason contender year after year after year. Um, Gavin Grant, same thing. He's been there the whole time. Drew Cali, a transfer from Cal Poly, Pomona. Um, just an unbelievable hitter. One of, the, one of the better guys in the team. Uh, just extremely talented, but a lot of the, the the true freshmen, the sophomores that I was able to talk to after the games and interview, a lot of them said that, you know, they want to go on this postseason run for the seniors. They want to do this for them. They want to do it for Tanner and Gavin and, and Drew Cowley um, because they've meant so much to those younger guys going up through the system that they just feel like they need to repay it. They didn't want to end the season on a low note, not make the tournament in Tanner Smith's last year. Um, so basically, yeah, they just been keep keeping on doing this for for all the seniors there. So I think that's the biggest storyline to me after you know going there for the tournament this past week and listening to all those interviews. You've you've covered this team the best in the market, I think. And I'm not saying that because we're coworkers. I think you've committed yourself being at almost every single game, every media availability. Um, you know this team inside and out, this program inside and out. It's the first conference championship they've won. They've, mm-hmm. they've got a lot of momentum going into the, the NCAAs now. But you just talked about rebuilding this program. What does a league title now mean for Waz for this program? I think it's three straight years in a row they've made the tournament. Now they've got the now they've got the the league title under their belt. It feels like Waz is you know the program every year is taking that next step that next step that next step they're mm-hmm. going you know they're they're still climbing what does this this season mean regardless of what happens in the tournament for, for the program as as a soul you know big picture wise i think it means a good amount um especially considering how they ended the regular season with losing eight of nine um i will say that this is only the second year the pac-12 tournament has has been a thing um which is a mistake in its own right but it's always good to win it. Uh, they weren't the first team to win it. They went 0-2 at the tournament last season. So to come back for the second season and win the whole thing, it's pretty impressive. But, you know, they would have won it, or excuse me, they would have played in the postseason four, four years in a row had the COVID season, you know, not been canceled due to COVID. That was probably, I might wager that was probably their most talented team, at least on paper, compared to the last couple of seasons. Um so the, what, what what head coach Mark Waskowski has done with this program has been remarkable. Um, he's turned it completely on its head compared to where they were with the George Horton era teams. Um, granted, those George Horton era teams were really, really good. A um, couple super regionals in there, a uh, couple regional hosts in there. Um, but Wands has you know brought some baseball life, some happiness, some uh, fan interaction, some fan experience back into PK Park here in Eugene. Um, and it showcased itself, itself again during the Pac-12 tournament with all the big hits, the home runs, the celebration, the uh, international flair that you get from Sabine Ceballos and Riku Nishida. Um, it's been a great season for Oregon, I would say. Uh, and I, I like to point out just like specifically rebounding after losing those eight of nine games, I think was just monumental. Um, I mean, I had people in my comment section of my articles and my Twitter mentions that uh, – we're asking for you know, basically like why was why is this team still a thing? Why do they bring back the baseball program? It loses money. They need to disband the baseball program and get rid of it. Um, I don't think so. I definitely do not think so. Uh, this is a good team. This is a talented team. There's going to be a lot of kids who are drafted from this team. Um, it's only going to continue to grow from here. 
It's just how I feel. You know, Oregon landed a top five recruiting class last season. Um, I think that was Baseball America's rankings. Um, they're recruiting well again this year. Um, that it's a hard thing to recruit well in college baseball because your best guys just go to the MLB draft. But you know, Oregon's got a lot of talent still, even if when they lose right. a couple of guys this year, um, they're going to be building more. Um, in the Pac-12 tournament, the championship there on ESPN two against Arizona, who's uh, a pristine Pac-12 tournament, uh, excuse me, a pristine Pac-12 member, um, won national championships, has plenty of draft picks, has plenty of history. Um, to beat them in the tournament title game, I think that helps as well. Um, I think it's just, you know, the program's still on the up and up. And again, you know, barring a Jay Stoffel injury, I'd be really interested to see where this team would be because, you know, before Stoffel went out, Oregon had won 14 of 16, 14 of 17. Um, they were on, they were cruising. Jay Stoffel was a guaranteed really good start on a Friday night. Um I think it would have been interesting to see where they would have ended up because, like you said, Matt, earlier in the pod, when we talked about this a month ago, you know, Oregon was in really good position yeah. to be hosting a regional. And you know, injuries happen. They always do. But to see them bounce back, I thought was really impressive. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll go shift gears a little bit to um, the Nashville Regional, get you kind of prepped things you need to know for that one. All right, welcome back to the Odds and Audibles podcast. Uh, Matt Prem, Jared Mack, we're talking Oregon baseball exclusively on today's podcast uh, because the Ducks are your Pac-12 tournament champs. They earned the league's automatic bid into the NCAA tournament, and they landed in uh, the Nashville Regional. They are a two seed. They play uh, number three seed Xavier on Friday, and depending on what happens there, They'll face off either against one seed Vanderbilt or four seed Eastern Illinois. Um, Jared rematch against Xavier. These teams, I don't know how many people are familiar with the schedule and whatnot, but they played the first week of the season Mm -hmm. and it was a four game homestand at home for the ducks. They won all four games and uh, Xavier turned out to be a pretty darn good team because they also won their conference tournament as well. What, what do we need to know about this? I guess, rematch in postseason play. Yeah, I mean, while it is a rematch, um, it's gonna, just going to be such a different circumstance this time around. Like, we're about to be heading into June, and Oregon and Xavier open the season at PK Park in February. I think it was yep. February 18th. Um, so both these teams are going to be extremely different by this point. Um, you know, Xavier was an interesting choice, I guess, when I saw the schedule for the first time. I was like, oh, I don't know if they're any good at baseball, but – uh, they were a huge RPI boost for the Ducks. Uh, talk about uh, postseason rankings and all that stuff. Um, winning the Big East, I think they beat UConn uh, to win the Big East. I think that was huge for them. Uh, this is a good hitting book program. Uh, Andrew Walker leads the team in average at 329. Uh, Matt McCormick, who had a good good series against Oregon at PK Park, 976 LPS. They've got uh, four guys, or excuse me, five guys who have hit uh, over over 10 home runs this season. Um, it's a good team. This is a very quality opponent, a very good three seed. Um, but I guess I think pitching wise, uh, Ethan Bosacker is probably their best guy. He, I think he held Oregon to uh, one run in seven innings during the first series of the season, um, which again, uh, it's February and you're hitting, it's not exactly what you want. Um, Brant Alizis, I don't know who they're going to throw on game one for Xavier, but he's a lefty. Um, I remember him pretty well. He, uh, didn't walk a lot of guys, um, doesn't have great strikeout stuff, but gets the job done. Uh, I think Oregon actually does pretty well against lefties, considering how left-handed heavy their lineup is, but I don't think that makes too much of a difference. Um, but, yeah, no, Xavier's a good program. Uh, they're a good team. They're certainly going to be a challenge. I think they're a very worthy three seed. Um, I just – I don't know if it sucks if you're, if you're a college baseball team and you face the same, I guess, the same team in the regional – I don't like. I it. don't know what to think of it. I I don't think it's that much, especially considering you know it's been three or four months since Oregon and Xavier played. But it would have been nice to see somebody new, especially from my perspective. Like, shoot, let's like where are we going to play Zan or excuse me Vanderbilt and maybe uh, Eastern Illinois? But you know, let me get I don't know Texas, somebody cool like that. 
Yeah, I, I don't. I personally don't like rematches unless there was some kind of like epic, crazy, you know, back and forth matchup. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, maybe they they tied two two, and every game came down to the last inning or something like that, where they're just yeah. clearly neck and neck. But this wasn't the case. Oregon swept Xavier, um, four game series. They had a walk off the first game of the year, three two. But yeah. I'm with you. It doesn't just. It doesn't sit with me. I don't like it, but that's the cards that Oregon's been dealt with. Um, and, and like you said, like those games were played in February, middle of February. So we're almost three and a half, four months since then. The teams are going to be totally different. Um, mm-hmm. Both teams are surging at the right time. Conference champs, both of them. Um, it should be a good game. It should be a fun matchup. That game's, uh, I believe, at noon. Pacific time. 10 a.m. 10 10 a.m. Pacific. I read it. uh, I read it as noon Central Standard Time, and then somebody commented, "It's like it's 10 a.m." Like, oh yeah, yeah. I just can't read. It's okay. Friday at 10 o'clock. That game's on ESPN Plus. Um, It's going to be an early morning game for us on the West Coast. You East Coasters can catch lunch and watch that one. But what are your thoughts just overall as Oregon seed two seed, but they're playing. Vanderbilt, who's traditionally a, a pretty strong, really good program at, based out of the SEC. Yeah, I think the two seed is fine. Uh, you know, they or I think Oregon really showed some guts during the Pac-12 tournament. I think that's a worthy position for the NCAA tournament. Um, Vanderbilt's just going to be Vanderbilt. Uh, this is just who they are. Uh, they are, gosh, they're a fun team to watch. Um, I sit down and I like basically every weekend, uh, much to my girlfriend's sugar and. I sit down and watch like two to three hours of, of baseball on uh, on YouTube and just the the highlights of the of the most recent series, all the games every weekend. Um, I've watched plenty of Vanderbilt. Um, that's a good team. Uh, they, they, and if you don't know who Vanderbilt is, like traditionally they are, uh, they're a baseball powerhouse. Um, they are. Yeah. How do I describe them? They are like a blue blood in college baseball, like a Kentucky or a Duke or a UNC in college basketball. That's what Vanderbilt is in college baseball. Um, over the last couple of years, they've had just tremendous pitching prospects uh, join the MLB, uh, get drafted first overall, get drafted in the first round, yada, yada, yada. Um, and I don't think this team is any different. Uh, Hunter Owen is their Friday night guy. Uh 315 ERA and 60 innings pitched. Uh, Devin Fultrill, who's kind of like a, a – He's more of a starter than anything else, but again, an absolute stud. Um, they got just arms up the wazoo coming out of the pen. Uh, it's going to be difficult for Oregon to really get some offense going, but again, Oregon is one of the best offensive teams. I mean, my eyes have ever seen. Uh, they're just loaded top to bottom, um, and they have an offense like I mentioned earlier, where if one guy gets hot, um, it can carry the whole team, and if one guy gets hot. That'll get other people to get hot, and it'll start clicking from there. So um, if Oregon has a good game one performance against Xavier, uh, I'm assuming that Vanderbilt's going to beat Eastern Illinois. No disrespect to Eastern Illinois. Um, if they win that game and they win it convincingly and they get the offense going, you know, I'm, I'm excited for that Vanderbilt potential there. Uh, the I mean, the biggest question for Oregon remains the pitching staff. And if the bullpen – uh, if their starters can give them, you know, two or three earned runs as, as a starter, then two or three earned runs out of the bullpen, if they can keep it within reason, like anywhere from two to two to five, maybe even two to six runs. Um, I think that gives Oregon a chance to win against basically anybody. But you know, this Vanderbilt team is is hard. Uh, R.J. Shrek, Chris Maldonado, uh, Enrique Bradfield, their center fielder, he's electric. I mean, this guy I think has like 125 career stolen bases. Uh, makes tremendous defensive plays nearly every game. Um, just one of the most fun players to watch in college baseball, like similar to Riku Nishida, just does things you don't see often on the baseball field. Um, this team is, is is really damn good. And But if Oregon's pitching staff can keep them to that like two to five, two to six threshold, um, I think Oregon could, could score enough runs just based purely on talent. Uh, but it's going to be a fun regional. I wish I could go. You, you kind of touched on a little bit of this. I feel like I know what your answer is going to be, but like, and like the NCAA tournament for basketball, you know, you, you see a team and you see their seeding and you see the matchups and you go, yeah, they're maybe not the best seed, but 
this is going to be a team that's going to be a popular team to make, you know, one or two upsets and get through the get through the bracket and make and make a run here. Do you get that sense that this is this Oregon team? Like they've got maybe a tough opponent on the opening round against Xavier, but is Vanderbilt beatable? I, I think you kind of answered a little bit of it, but does Oregon have a chance here, or is this going to be a game where, hey, Oregon has to play A plus baseball and get lucky to advance? I think Oregon has to play A-plus baseball and get lucky to advance. Um, I think that's what happened in the Pac-12 tournament. Like we opened the podcast with, if Stanford makes yeah. that relay throw, uh, even if they just hold Colby Shade to a triple, um, maybe Oregon doesn't move on. Maybe Oregon doesn't get to the Pac-12 championship game. Um, but that's baseball. Everybody needs luck. doesn't matter how yeah. good you are. Um, everybody's going to need some luck every once in a while. But – you know, it's it, it's hard for me to have a real inventory of what this team looks like because, you know, two weeks ago I watched them put up 43 or allow 43 runs in three inning or excuse me, three games to Washington. Just an absolute putrid display. Um, I think the Saturday game, Washington sent nine batters up in the first inning and all nine of them came home to score. It was the perfect offensive inning. I've never seen anything like it in my life in the in, a, in a, just a horrendous way. And then they went two or three at Utah. Again, the worst team in the Pac-12, mind you. And then they, you know, Beat Stanford, number eight overall seed. Beat Cal. Beat Washington. Have the revenge there. And then win a 5-4 to four game against Arizona, one of the best offenses in the country, let alone the Pac-12. So it's hard for me to take inventory of what this team really is. However, I know that they're going to hit the ball. You just know this. The whole season they've hit the ball. Last season they hit the ball. Two years ago they hit the ball. This is a hitting team and has always been under Wazikowski and heading coach Jack Martyr. Will the pitching show up? And if the pitching gives them a B-plus level, like just slightly above average, I think the offense can do enough damage to where they can get out of this regional and maybe go to a super regional. If the pitching doesn't show up, good luck. It's going to be a tough one. Yeah. It's going to be a slugfest basically every game. Um, so I think it's possible. I think it's doable. They just need the pitching to show up like it happened in the Pac-12 tournament. And hopefully they get enough rest. And they get an early Nashville to get a, a feel for the environment. But they got the first game on Friday. So we'll we'll know from there. I guess the, the last question I had on, on, on my docket for here is just is this team and the way that they're constructed, is this kind of like you, you mentioned the three seniors on the team and the, and the impact that they've had? Is this team constructed where like the window is closing? after this season and it's going to take a year or two to reload and get back or is the window wide open and this is just the start of you know something really fun for Oregon baseball and if you're a fan enjoy this weekend enjoy this this run in the tournament for as long as it goes but also know that hey it's gonna it's gonna keep going the next couple of years yeah no I think it's gonna keep going the next couple of years uh, you know Tanner and Drew and Gavin Graham were all significantly uh, important and impactful members of this Oregon baseball program um, but I think they got real dudes coming in behind them um, and I think there's a chance that some guys stay and don't enter the the MLB draft um, there's always a transfer portal I know it's not as reported on as the college football transfer portal but uh, the baseball transfer portal can certainly put a lot of good names in there. Uh, you look at Drew Cowley, I know Owen Diodotti didn't necessarily pan out at Oregon, but um, that was a guy who was a higher ranked uh, transfer portal recruit. Um, there are options for Mark Wasikowski and his, and his staff. Um, this is a good recruiting staff as well. They do a really good job of getting guys on campus. Uh, similar to what football goes through, not a lot of teams in the country have a better facility than Oregon baseball. Um, they just have, they've got a great field. They got brand new turf that came in two years ago. Um, you know, they use part of the HDC, uh, to use, uh, to use in, you know, workouts, stuff like that, team, team dinners, team breakfasts. Um, it's a really easy place to recruit and that's, a, that's a great part. And they have great Southern California ties where a lot of good baseball players are from. Um, and then most of their freshmen, I think I've been, you know, impressed by this season, like, like Dominic Hellman, who's hurt, Drew Smith, Carter Garotti. I know Bennett Thompson is a freshman, but sophomore, he's good. he should be the starting catcher every day next season, I think. Um, there's a lot of talent coming in. It's going to hurt because you're going to lose a lot of experience and then some really good talent in Callie Smith and Grant and others, depending on how the MLB draft goes. But I think that this window is open. 
And I think as long as Mark Wazikowski is here and he retains his staff and uh, the athletic department continues to support them with, you know, off the field hires, uh, Oregon will have a new or will have the opportunity to hire another assistant coach this off season. As long as the athletic department continues to support them in the way they have and the way Rob Mullins and, you know, Pat Kilkenny have, I think it'll be a, a large window. All right, that's going to do it for us on this edition of the Austin Ottawa's podcast. You can follow all of the coverage of Oregon baseball by Jared uh, on DuckTerritory.com. Again, Friday, 10 a.m., early start to the day. ESPN Plus, they take on Xavier. Uh, both programs have won 37 games this season. They're in the Nashville Regional. So depending on what happens there, they'll play their one-seed Vanderbilt. Uh, or four seed Eastern Illinois. Uh, game two, regardless, uh, will be on Saturday. If they win on Friday, they play at uh, six o'clock in the evening, Friday, uh, Saturday night, or they play at noon if they lose that one. Um, it's a double elimination tournament. You got to lose twice to get out. Uh, if it goes this far, it could be playing as as late as Monday, June fifth, a game seven. Uh, for that regional, Jared will have full coverage of it on DuckTerritory.com. But until the next show here, you've been listening to the Odds and Audible's podcast. Peace.